Hello, my friends, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of Dr. Mercurio's Mythical Marvels and Traveling Menagerie. Yes, it has taken forever to get this episode up because, well, you know why. We're based out of California, so most of us are still locked down as the cases rise. So we're all recording all our different parts and lines separately. And I've stitched them all together to create what I think is probably one of our best shows to date. One of the reasons I like this particular show so much is because we've added some new voices. Michelle Abnell, who also co-wrote this episode with me, and Colette Harrison. Both of these people are dragon ears of the highest order and they perform in our live performances, so it seemed only fitting to add them to the podcast. Speaking of the live show, if you haven't heard, we have a channel on YouTube now where you can not only listen to the podcast, but see many of the people who perform in it as well as the many creatures in Mercurial's world in our new miniseries, The Encyclopedia Mercurial. There's two episodes up there right now, and I'm working on more to put up in the coming weeks. So check it out. See what we all look like. Finally, for those of you who didn't know, before the new normal, the show itself was also an inspirational school assembly. We bring larger-than-life dragons, unicorns, and other amazing creatures to uh, elementary and middle schools, and we perform an hour-long show, which was followed up by a lecture, about how every incredible feature of the puppets we showed the kids would not be possible without skills such as math, science, engineering, and even language arts as we had to write the story they just watched. The goal itself being to show a practical use for the skills they're being taught. With that said, I'm pleased to announce that we are in the process of creating a virtual version of that show, which will be followed by a 30-minute live Q&A and a virtual behind-the-scenes tour of the Puppetry Institute studio where you can see things like what makes a 13-foot tall Yeti puppet work. The show will be available to stream to your school, remote learner, homeschool group, or learning pod this September. Click the links in the show notes below for more information and details on how to bring this show plus the Puppetry Institute's other live streaming workshops to your students. With that said, let's settle in, adjust our headphones, and turn it over to our good friend, the doctor. Step up, step up, who among you is not ready for a tale of high adventure, mythical creatures, and the most amazing man you'll ever meet? Yes, it is I, Dr. Elphias Mercurio, inviting you to step up, Madame's and Messieurs, my dominant heron, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dr. Mercurio's mythical marvels and traveling menagerie. According to the chronometer, Midla will be materializing directly under us in three, two, one. Mercurial Manor, dead ahead, Doctor. Set the ship down on the south lawn and get the dragons fed and bedded down for the night. The rest of you, unload enough provisions for a three-day stay and have supper prepared for my return. Return from where, sir? If I may be so bold as to ask. I find myself in need of some quality family time. Speaking of family, get word to your cousin. She needs to be ready to leave in three days' time or we'll have to find someone else. Trust me, sir, she'll be ready. Enjoy your family time! So just like that, we are back on the disappearing island of Milov. For those of you not familiar with our previous adventures, Milov is our floating island home. Due to its unique geological makeup, the whole island is able to disappear from one spot in the ocean of nowhere and reappear in another spot, sometimes thousands of miles away. The island itself was discovered by the Doctor's great-grandfather, who was also the architect of the once-great Mercurio Manor. I say once-great, as the estate's glory days are sadly behind it now. What damage time and neglect had not caused, the rambunctious nature of our two young dragons finished off. 
I shudder to think what kind of damage our latest acquisition, Pop the Zawu, will contribute. With all that random electrical current she emits, I'll be surprised if the whole place doesn't burn to the ground. But home is where the heart is, and as the only other home Percy and I have ever known was the middle of orphanage, this rickety old mansion will forever hold a place in my heart. All hands on deck, prepare for landing. Ready on the bowling, Sadie. Percy, keep a firm hand on the stern line. I slowly released the pressure from the gas bag, and the airship settled down onto the ground with just a slight bump. Uh, you might want to work on that last bit, Miss Primrose, but other than that, very nice work, very nice work indeed. Good lord, Penelope, where'd you learn how to land, or should I say crash? Stop your belly aching, Percy. You did fine, love. Not easy getting this old girl on the ground without a bump or two. Well, if this little meeting of the landing committee is over, we have lots to do and only three days to do it. Miss Primrose has my orders, so I will see you all at dinner. Now, where's Pop? <laughs> Ye gods! Why does she have to do that? That's simple, Percy. You see, Pop's entire makeup is based on positive and negative energies. Not just electrons, but emotions and attitude as well. When she phases into existence, she's emitting a vast amount of positive energies. So naturally, she'll pop in next to the most negative thing in the room. I don't understand. As per usual. He's saying, since you were being such a negative Nancy about Penelope's landing, you were the negative force in the room. But, but. No buts about it, dear boy. If you don't want Pop to single you out as her favorite landing spot, I would suggest that you, as they say, lighten up a bit. Now, if you excuse me, I have a meeting to attend. Come along, Pop. Well, let's get to it, you lot. We have a lot to do before the doctors return. You're not the boss of me, Penelope. And another thing, if you think... What was that you were saying, Percy? If you think of anything else I can do to make the ship a happy environment, then don't hesitate to ask. You really must hire someone to sort out the family plot. My dear Pa, allow me to introduce you to the deceased members of my family. Mother, grandparents, father, meet Pop. I see from your lack of response, dear family, that you are amazed. Yes, she is the last of this wows. Yes, it's true, great-great-great-grandfather Malcolm. Many is the evening I sat on grandfather Millard's knee, listening to your many exploits and attempts to find a living zwow. I'm sure you're so envious that you are turning green. Although, that might have something to do with being dead for so long. Well, not a peep from you, Father. But it might interest you to know that acquiring a living zwao is not the only check mark on the family bucket list. There's also this. What is this? Why, my dear Father, this is your own personal grail. The one thing you valued more than your family. This, dear Father, is the original Book of Songs. No, Mother, I'm not being terse, simply stating a fact. Many is the time when he was needed at home, but was off in search of this very tome. And on the rare times he was home, he shut himself away in the library, spending all his time researching the scroll's powers. So, quite the contrary, dear Mother. My intent is not to chastise Father, but to tell him that now the Book of Songs is in my possession. I finally understand the why of it all. That's why I'm here. With the help of your research, Father, I'll be able to decipher the key to open portals to a thousand different universes and a million different dimensions. Most importantly, I'll be able to correct a mistake born entirely of my own hubris and save my friends. Yes, Mother, that is a noble decision. No, I have no idea where I inherited that from. But I would imagine it's your side of the family. Do try to be more careful, Pop. I believe you just desecrated my great Aunt Lavinia. Although I'm sure she's way past the point of care. Well, family, as always, it's been a delightful chat. But there are worlds to explore and friends to rescue.
In no time at all we were settled in for our stay at the manor. As much as I love our old airship, it is nice to be able to stretch out a bit in the mansion's huge, dusty bedrooms. Sadie soon had the dragons fed and bedded down and went about restocking the moon's munitions and stores. Percy and I were working on getting an hot supper prepared when the doctor returned from his trip to the family cemetery and went directly to the library. No doubt, going through the vast collection of books to find us a way into Simia and our missing friends. But the look on his face when he joined us at the table did not instil me with hope. I trust the research is going well, Doctor? As well as can be expected, Miss Primrose. From what I could ascertain, there's a high chance that there's an area where we might be able to cross over to Simia. That's great news! When do we leave? I'm afraid it's not that easy. I'll need to map out a route. Penelope can help with that. Navigation is one of the few things she does right, as it certainly isn't cooking. No sooner than my idiot brother had uttered that negative review of my lack of cooking talents, Pop phased in right in the dimwit's lap. His rickety old chair, unable to take the weight, buckled and crashed to the floor. Smiling like a nightmarish Cheshire cat, the creature gave my brother a playful boop on the nose and popped off again. Looks like you're going to have to change your name to Positive Percy or lose a lot of pesky brain cells. Don't be daft, Sadie. You can't lose something you never had. Hey! I'd be insulted if I think I could remember why. While Percy tries to remember why he's mad, let's get back to the matter at hand. As I was saying, I'll need to map out a route through the floating mountains of Never Was. The reason for Mercurio's apprehension was now clear. The floating mountains of Never Was might as well have been named the airship graveyard. The mountains contain trace elements of Boobaroo, the same element that causes the islands of Middle Love to disappear from one spot in the ocean of nowhere and reappear in another. Even though the amount of Boobaroo in the floating mountains is small, it causes the mountains to float through the sky and occasionally flicker out and into existence for a moment. This made for an extremely dangerous place for an airship trying to navigate through the dense clouds of Never Was. Begging your pardon, Doctor, but navigating Never Was is a bit above my pay grade. Not to worry, Miss Primrose, as you won't be doing it alone. It will take the entire crew, beasties included, to successfully pull off this little maneuver. The last time I calculated the variables of this endeavor, the odds of success were a thousand to one. That is why acquiring a top-notch engineer is vital to this mission. I trust you know where to find your cousin? Most likely somewhere cheating at cards. Shut up, Percy. Or in the town stockade. Shut up, Percy. Good lord, Percy. What did this girl do to get your knickers in such a twist? Don't say a word. Shall I tell her, Percy? Shall I tell Sadie why Pippin gets under your skin so bad? Shut up, Penelope. Ooh, I can tell this is going to be good. Spill it, Penelope. Ever since the two of them were little, Pippin has done her best to outdo Percy at everything he ever tried. Games of chance. She cheats. Competitions. That ballroom dance challenge was all a popularity contest. Which explains how she beat you. Shut up, Sadie. But the biggest blow to my brother's overinflated ego was when Pippin bested him in getting adopted first. This couple... Couple of nincompoops, if you ask me. Was seriously considering adopting Percy. Sounds like nincompoops to me. Shut up, Sadie. On the day that they came in to sign the adoption papers, Pippin suddenly took an interest in them, and in the blink of an eye, they changed their minds and left with her that very day. Be that as it may, Percy, we need your cousin to save Sprocket. So, no squabbling. If we can't get her to take the position, then I'll have to offer it to Sadie's mother. 
Ye gods, no! If that happens, then you'll be looking for a new security officer, too. So play nice, Percy. It had been almost six months since our last adventure at the middle of Bazaar, when Precious accidentally tried to eat the mayor's prize-winning pooch. But the shocked looks on the vendors, shopkeeps and customers said that our dragons were not easily forgotten. Of course, it might have had something to do with the fact that our Precious had grown another six feet and gained another hundred or so pounds. I don't know why they'd be so worried. She was muzzled to prevent any further dog munching, and Sadie had her under control, mostly. I had Ping Ping with us as well, who as per usual was doing her best to annoy Percy. After asking around for Cousin Pippin, the general consensus was that we should talk to the haberdasher. So off we went, leaving a swath of nervous mothers and gasping men in our wake. For those of you not familiar with haberdashery, it's the business of men's clothing. For those of you not familiar with my brother Percy, you should know that the thing he loves most, other than himself, is men's fashion. No sooner was the shop in sight than he was off in search of something new to add to his growing wardrobe of foppish finery. Leaving Sadie outside with Precious, Ping and I entered to find Percy flitting about like a humming bat from rack to shelf while the shopkeep ignored us as he busied himself with what looked to be a very affluent patron. Before I could get his attention to ask after Pippin, Percy sprang up in front of me wearing the most ridiculous hat I had ever seen. Tell me this is not the most perfect hat you have ever seen. I dare you, tell me it isn't. On his head was what I could only describe as a straw plate with a felted stuffed falcon and a sprig of wax berries. As they say, Percy, even a stopped clock is right at least twice a day. But sadly, that is not the case here. It is not the most perfect hat I have ever seen, and I can honestly say that it makes you look a lot like you are carrying a dinner plate on your head. Before my brother could school me in the fashionable need for dinner plate headwear, Ping Ping took my comments literally and snatched the top off Percy's silly chapeau. Bird, berries, and from the sound of my brother's squealing, a wee bit of scalp as well. On the plus side, we finally got the shopkeep's undivided attention. What is that beast doing in my shop? Ah, that beast is my brother, sir, and I believe he was interested in one of your obviously delicious hats. Do not get cheeky with me. That hat costs 12 gold pieces. So just who is going to pay for it? Goodness, delicious and expensive. Here we are. One, two... Three, other than purchasing one of your delicious hats, we were told that you might tell us, uh, four, five, six, where we might be able to find my cousin. Seven, eight, nine. Did you forget how to count? Ten, eleven, twelve. And be quick about it before I call the militia. Well, it's like this. It seems that nine is all I have. My cousin has the other gold pouch, and as I said, we were told you could tell us where to find her. So if you could point us in the right direction, we'll get the rest of the money from her and be on our way. I am sure you are misinformed. What is this cousin's name? Uh, Pippin. Pippin T. Primrose. Ah, Primrose, you say. It seems apologies are in order. I know exactly where your cousin is. Give me but a moment. For a brief second, I swore I saw a strange look in the man's eye as he walked over to the counter and wrote out a quick note before stuffing it in an envelope and sealing it shut with wax. Here, take this to City Hall and give it to the guard at the door and he will take you directly to your cousin. What's she doing at City Hall? She's quite popular there at the moment. That's her, popular Pippin the Pratt. Now, if you would be so kind as to remove this beast from my shop before he eats the two of you into the poorhouse, and make sure you return with my three gold pieces. With the Abadasha's note in hand, we made our way back outside. 
As per usual, Precious had drawn quite a crowd, and Sadie was leading her while a group of small children rode on her back. Charging the little runs of copper for a ride. Sorry through the window, emptying our coffer, so thought I'd get to work filling it back up. Not a bad idea. So, you found your cousin then? Yes, it seems she's become a civil servant. Ew! Doesn't sound much like the girl you told me about. If I know Pippin, she has some kind of deception in the works. Oh, Pippin excels at that. Here, Percy, take Pink. And stay here with Sadie and entertain the crowd while I go and fetch Pippin. Why do I have to do it? It's not like that flatulent worm listens to me. Just play a few games of Fling the Fishy with her. Do the patter. It's your fault that we find ourselves broke. What? Do not want to see our cousin any sooner than you have to. Now make yourself useful and put some smiles on faces and get the hat filled with coins. Middle Love City Hall was on the other side of the city, which gave me time to think what I could offer Pippin. I wondered if a low-paying suicide mission would be enough to lure her away from whatever nefarious scam she had working at City Hall. My cousin never does anything without there being a good-sized payout, so I had about as much chance as getting her help as I did of having her and Percy sit down for tea. Arriving at City Hall, I was surprised to find a queue lining around the building. That could only mean one thing. The yearly banishment trial was in session, and everyone wanted to get a good seat. You see, Middle Love is such a magical place that the worst punishment that you can get is to be voted off in the yearly banishment trial. The unlucky criminal is placed in a rowboat, set out to sea, and then when the island vanishes, they are never able to find it again. Not caring to witness another banishment, I walked past the crowd to the guard station, was about to hand him the haberdasher's note, when none other than his honour, Mayor Squigglebottom, rudely cut me off. Luckily, he didn't recognise me as part of Mercurio's crew, or I most likely would have been next up on the docket. Looks like a good crowd today, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Magistrate Judge Judith is presiding, and the accused is widely despised amongst the Hoi Polloi. So, should be quite a show, sir. Excellent. As this opportunity only comes once a year, please make sure we have extra Judge Judith Mead mugs, as well as those I went to trial and didn't get banished blouses. Yes, should be a good day indeed. Leave it to Mayor Squigglebottom to look forward to making a profit off of someone's misery. As far as I was concerned, the quicker I could find Pippin, the quicker I could get out of here and back to the manor. Keeping my head down, I approached the guard handing him the note. Breaking the wax seal, he looked over the note, back at me, then back at the note. And you say this is from the haberdasher? Yes, he said to give it to you and you would take me to my cousin. And he was right, Miss... Yes, uh, Penelope. My cousin is uh, Pippin? Pippin T. Primrose. I gather you know her? Oh, yes, she's one of the most well-known people here. The bell of the ball, so to speak. Follow me. And I'll take you right to her. I had no idea what kind of deception Pippin was involved in. I mused, walking behind the guard, but leave it to her to ingratiate herself into being the Belle of Midlove. For a moment, I thought we'd be heading up to the top floor, but was surprised as we turned down a long flight of stairs toward the magistrate's offices and guards' quarters. What is it that Pippin does here in the Magistrate's office? Oh, she's not in the Magistrate's office. She has her own suite. Ah, here we are. I watched as he pulled a large key from his belt and unlocked a massive door. 
I turned to make an escape, but two other guards who had silently slipped up behind me blocked my way. They quickly grabbed me from either side as the guard opened the door to reveal a large, dark cell with a pile of dirty rags in the corner. Before I could protest, they chucked me in, slamming the door. <laughs> Looks like it's a bad day to be a primrose, what? I demand you tell me why I'm being held. Get back here and open this door this instant. If you don't open this door this instant, I'll... I'll... Do what? Sick your dragons on them? Maybe get your brother to come in redesign their uniforms? Really, cousin, try to be quieter. Some of us need our beauty rest. The voice that came from the pile of rags was all too familiar. Slowly, the pile stood up to reveal itself to be... My little cousin. What have you gotten me into this time, Pippin? Why, cousin, I have absolutely no idea what you mean. We'll be back right after this message. I'd like to talk for just a minute or two to those parents with kids learning from home. I want to talk to you about the Puppetry Institute's online and live streaming workshops. For the past four years, the Institute itself has taught puppetry, costuming, and effects art to children and adults on the Central Coast, both at our big studio in Capitola and in schools and low-income housing communities throughout the Central Coast. Times being as they are, we have converted 75% of our classes into online and live stream workshops. Our classes are not just your basic art class, but address VAPA standards such as design, construction, puppetry, theater, and concept artistry, as well as being a true STEAM experience, as all of our classes involve two or more standards from science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Each class and workshop comes with a kit containing everything you need to turn your students' imagination into a reality. Easy to follow instructional videos and up to 10 hours of live instruction from one of the Institute's talented artists. Workshops are affordable and group prices are available with a portion of all fees going to support the Puppetry Institute Scholarship Program, which provides free kits and workshops to low-income, special needs, and kids of essential workers. What can be better? You learn something and you pass a little art along to someone who needs it. Check the show notes to find out more and help make this world a cooler place, one puppet at a time. Dash it all! Well, bought my damn. There seems to be no other way of getting around it. According to Great Grandfather's charts, we will most definitely have to travel through Neverwas. To make matters worse, according to this passage in the Book of Songs, the mountain where the lost Simeon Polo resides is only visible for a period of no more than 90 seconds. This, of course, means... Judging by your graceful entrance, I surmise that it is safe to assume that your mission to retrieve your cousin and return quickly went as per usual. Incomplete disaster. Please, do enlighten me as to our current predicament. It wasn't my fault! The stupid dragon ate the hat, so Penelope took the note to City Hall, and Ping ate the fish before we could play Fling the Fishy, and Sadie met up with an old friend, but they got into fisticuffs over some old debts and got arrested, and so I had to go to City Hall and found out that Penelope and Pippin, Pippin were already in jail, and so I had to bring both dragons home by myself, and Precious broke the front door. Percy, I stand in light. So, Sadie's brawling is a, is a mere misdemeanor, so it's just a matter of paying her fine. I'm afraid to ask, what are the other primroses accused of? It seems they're both due in banishment court within the hour. Pippin for grand larceny, and Penelope for being related to a larcenist, and there was something about a warrant, but it was not... Your fault, so you said. Well, as always, the task of pulling you lots of bacon from the fire falls to me. I'll need you to prepare for a quick departure. Now pack up these charts and books and stow them away in my cabin. Also, have the moon's boiler fired up in the slight chance we bring an angry mob back with us. Then get the dragons to the rear entrance of City Hall, where you will meet up with Sadie to wait for my cue. Right away, Doctor. Pop, if you would be
be so kind as to bring me to the alleyway behind City Hall? After a few minutes of mentally kicking myself in the posterior for believing that my cousin had ingratiated herself to the middle of hierarchy, I got her to tell me why we were both headed to banishment court. So, let's see if I have this straight. You were trying to run a long game on the haberdasher by trying to convince him that you were his long-lost niece who was kidnapped as a child by pirates. That is about the gist of it. In my defense, how was I supposed to know that I was the third person to run this swindle on him? Including the real niece who bamboozled the old sod out of a hundred gold pieces. May I add, how was I supposed to know you'd be the next person to try and run this scam? I thought you were off-island traipsing about with dragons. Here I thought you got yourself into a cushy con job, and in reality, you botched it up! To make matters worse, the haberdasher evidently thinks I'm in on your little confidence game, and now I'm stuck in here with you, Pippin! You are such a ninny! Well, as you tried to run a scam on the haberdasher right after I had been pinched for the same offense, I can say, in all fairness, I know you are, but what am I? Oh, really? I had nothing to do with swindling that dreadful old man. My dragon ate this hat that Percy... Percy's part of the story. You're lucky they just threw you in lockup. How is little Percy? Still a simpering git, I imagine? So I didn't have enough for the hat. So I explained that I was looking for my cousin, Pippin Primrose. Well, there's your first mistake. I'm sure they'll see I'm not part of your idiotic plan and release me. Maybe so. But given your unfavorable associations with the Mercurios, they might just overlook that. Rumor has it you and your dragons caused quite the stir the last time. Ate the mayor's prize hound, I heard. Oh, it was hardly a hound. It was a shih tzu. And she spit it out. You know, this might just work out for me. Excuse me? Well, as you know, Middle of Yan Law says that there can only be one banishment a year. As I was the only criminal in lockup, it was looking like I was the obvious choice. But now that you're here... With that old dog abuse warrant, plus your hat thievery, the odds are now 50-50. Good on me. Say, what brings you here anyway? You didn't return here just to buy dreadful overpriced hats, I assume. Well, it just so happens our engineer has been sucked into another dimension, and we are on a very noble mission to get her back. I put in a good word for you with the doctor, because I thought that you were brave, clever, and that would be an excellent fit for our short-staffed crew. But given you'd so quickly throw me to the wolves for your escape, I rescind those words. May the best Primrose win. Sounds to me like the good doctor is in need of my talents. Perhaps if you're banished off the island, you'll have little choice but to hire me anyway. Where are you going, you coward? I'll teach you to mess with the McBiggins. Come back here and I'll take you all on with one arm tied behind my back. Which was quite the accurate statement as her one good arm was tied to the other just above the brass plug which normally connected to her arm cannon. I bent down to untie her and helped her to her feet. Looks like the odds just got better, cousin. Don't start counting your chickens, Pip. Sadie, please tell me you're not the rescue party. Afraid not, love. Got in a bit of a tussle with an old acquaintance and the middle of Ian guard snatched me up. Not to worry, though. I sent Percy to fetch Mercurio. Percy? Save us? Well, I'll just pack my rags then, shall I? You must be Pippin, Percy's favorite cousin. Don't see the resemblance. I trust one of you has an escape plan on the tremendous chance that Percy makes a mess of things. Uh, not yet. Sadly, my cousin has proven most uncooperative. Her plan is hoping that it will be one of us that gets banished. Pippin, this is Sadie, one of our fellow crew members. Just wait till they hear you two are working for Mercurio, though. The Midlothians mistrust him so much. I'll look like a perfect angel in comparison. Don't be so quick to throw us under the airship, dearie. I was just fighting. I'll get off with a fine. Penelope here is like family to the doctor, so you can bet your last gold piece that she's not going anywhere. So you might want to rethink your plan there. 
Finding herself without a snappy retort, my cousin returned to her corner with a harumph, turned her back on both of us with a wry smile. Sadie leaned close to me and whispered, She is a petulant little primrose, isn't she? She is going to be a simply fine fit with her little bunch. So we all sat in silence as we waited for what would happen next, and I wondered on the wisdom of bringing my cantankerous cousin into our world. Moments later, we heard the guards return and open the door. McMiggins, your fine's been paid. You can collect your weapons on the way out. There better not be one scratch on my gear or you and I are going to have words, my friend. Be good, Primroses. Try not to kill each other while I'm gone. See you soon. Well, considering you two drew Judge Judith for a magistrate, and from the sound of that courtroom, she'll only be able to keep that promise to one of you. Ha ha, I love Banishment Day. Pippin and I were ushered into the overpacked courtroom by armed guards. There wasn't an empty seat in the house as the locals clad in brightly coloured banishment blouses leered and catcalled while we were led to separate lecterns. The judge's bench loomed above us with a tiny bespeckled court reporter to the right of the judge's seat and the Lord Mayor on the left. Squigglebottom eyed me with so much malice I was sure he would recommend my banishment over Pippin's. But before I could worry further on my fate, the booming voice of Middlelove's fiercest magistrate filled the air as she entered. All may rise, court is now in session. Judge Judith took her seat and waved to her adoring fans and then looked down at Pippin and me, pointing an accusing finger at the both of us. The crowd broke out into screams and cheers, only quieting when Judith brought down the gavel with a loud crack. Thank y'all for joining us to witness justice at today's banishment trial. Standing before you are two defendants. Each are charged with crimes against you. The citizens of Middle Earth. Both have a history of skirting and abusing the law on many occasions. But today, they stand before you also accused of the most heinous crime of trying to take advantage of a poor shopkeeper. The crowd let out a hiss as the house lights dimmed and a bright spotlight illuminated the haberdasher, who was doing his best to look the part of the victim, as the mayor leaned over to whisper something into the judge's ear, who with a bang of her gavel brought the court to order. I have also been informed that one of the defendants is also a fugitive from our good justice. <laughs> these young ladies will be allowed to finish her sentence in our spacious dungeon today. The other will immediately be banished from the island of Middle forever. This of course got the gawkers and the gloaters worked up again as concession workers weaved their way through the excited crowd, offering up kettle corn and mugs of sweet mead in cheap mugs in the shape of the judge's head. Judith gave the throng a moment to collect their food and souvenirs before bringing the gavel down again. The lights dimmed again as the spotlight fell on me. Penelope Primrose, is it true that you fled Midlove six months ago from an outstanding warrant? And upon your return, you failed to turn yourself over to the authorities? Yes, but in my defense, I had no idea that the warrant had been- ah! Ignorance of the law is no excuse. It also says here that upon your return, you took up your life of crime again by trying to bilk this poor, simple haberdasher by shortchanging him on an expensive purchase. The spotlight fell on the haberdasher again, who looked even more pitiful. That was 
just a misunderstanding. You see, my dragon accidentally ate- Ah, yes, your dragon. Is this dragon the same or different from the dragon that viciously ate the mayor's prize Shih Tzu? Uh, this was a different dragon. Uh, but to be clear, Precious did not technically eat the dog as she spat her out. She held up her hand to cut me off as the mayor whispered into her ear again. So, it appears that none of these creatures have been registered with the Bureau of Mythical Creatures. Which adds another charge to your list of crimes. I object. <laughs> yes, dear, I'm sure you do. I believe we have heard enough from you. In the interest of speedy justice, let us move on. The spotlight now fell on Pippin, who was doing her best to look small and frightened. Pippin, Primrose! Did you, or did you not, request money from the very same aforementioned vendor under the guise of a long-lost relation? I have no idea how, but at that moment my cousin managed to look even more the wide-eyed innocent. Well, you see, my honor. I was without guidance. It's my two cousins, the only family I had in the world, abandoned me to go off with the pirate Mercurio and his dragons, leaving me alone to fend for myself. And, and I heard he, the haberdasher I mean, had lost someone to pirates as well. So I suppose I naively thought, I, I... I bristled as Pippin paused to wipe a huge crocodile tear from her eye and grinned as she flinched when the judge brought her gavel down hard. It was obvious that tears were not going to work. Cut the waterworks, little missy. It states here in the haberdasher's police report that after introducing yourself, you hastily requested funding to travel abroad. Well... Not exactly. The plan was to get to know my benefactor until- When? A few weeks, maybe? Until your cousin, who you say abandoned you, just happened to show up at that very same haberdashery only a few weeks later to help you steal not only gold, but expensive hats as well? I never abandoned her. We, we just couldn't- Ha! You admit it then. This whole fabrication is starting to unravel. Why, the two of you cannot even cooperate on the same story. She did abandon me, Your Honor. Led me to a life of crime and bad decisions. Now she denies leaving, only to come back to entice me into a life of corruption upon the heads of innocent haberdashers. The two of you are accused of jointly hatching a scheme to rob the alleged victim. So far, the only evidence you have offered me otherwise is that you two primroses can hardly get along well enough to hatch a plan. My guess is that there's no honor among thieves, and you are at each other's throats because each of you blames the other for bungling your little plot. Squigglebottom once again leans over to whisper in the judge's ear as my cousin and I exchange barbed looks. Esteemed mayor has made a wonderful suggestion that should not only satisfy the needs of the court, but provide justice to all concerned. That said, since I would hate to break up this charming family reunion, I believe we'll make an exception this year and banish you both. This was great news for the rowdy rabble who celebrated with raising their head mugs into the air in a toast. any objections, and I certainly do not see why they would, I will pass. I object. A hushed silence fell on the crowd as Mercurio strode down the aisle. He looked at me in passing, mouthing the words, be ready. As he passed, he stopped in front of the bench and tipped his hat to Mayor Squigglebottom. Well, may I say it's nice to see you again, Piggle Snodum. That's Squigglebottom to you, Mercurio. Of course it is, Nickelbottle. Squigglebottom. And Judith. 
May I say that you are looking younger every day. Have you had work done, or is your bun screwed on too tight? Hello, Elphias. And may I say... You most certainly cannot say, as I object. Just what grounds do you, of all people, have to object about? I object on the grounds that these entire grounds are objectionable. Your judgeness, your honor, your judiest. Surely a judicator of your genius, and I use that term in the loosest sense of the word, can recall the ruling of Judge von Pumpernickel in 1822, when this very court was founded under the financing of my own great-grandfather. Ah, uh, yes. All defendants are ensured a full hearing, and all evidence presented shall be given equal time and thought for consideration when present on these grounds of justice. What? Is your point. Is that what the ruling was on? Strange, I thought it had something to do with badgers, as my grandfather lost a pinky toe to one of the little buggers. He never did walk right again. Again. I will ask you, Elphias, what is the point? Other than the obvious point of mere twizzle snooties, <laughs> nose is the case of, is, well, have you also considered the 1826 case of Professor Walter Wigglesworth, the Weird, versus Captain Horatio Calamari? Again, I fail to see what bearing this has on the situation at hand. Elphias, what does this have to do with anything? Yes, well, Professor Wigglesworth, as you know, was a cephalopod enthusiast. If you recall, he was brought into court for the crime of Grand Theft Cephalopod after unloading thousands of squid, octopi, and friendly little cuttlefish from the captain's cargo, while under the guise of one of his employees. Professor Wigglesworth maintained his deeds were for the good of tentacled mollus kind everywhere, and, of course, was banished from the island. He swore he would be back to liberate more before being set out to sea in his little boat where he was immediately devoured by a red-banded kraken. Again, I fail to see what bearing this has on the situation at hand. Elphias, what does this have to do with anything? Well, nothing really, but I always thought it was an interesting story. So I thought we should set this case aside for the time being and busy ourselves in the construction of a monument to honor the sacrifices of red-banded krakens everywhere. Well, Doctor... I have indeed considered your evidence, but since I find it pure poppycock, my decision remains unchanged. Therefore, I sentence... Percy, get back here! for crying out loud. The judge was interrupted again as the galumphing precious and a growling pink crashed into the room with Sadie and Percy in tow. The two dragons ran down the aisle growling and shoving through the crowd causing panic and disarray while Judge Judith and her team desperately tried to regain order. I turned to see my own brother pop the barrier to approach Pippin in all the uproar with Ping sitting on his shoulders hissing at the bailiff. We finally meet again, dear cousin. Why, I haven't seen you since you stole my chance to get adopted into a good family. Which apparently wasn't good enough for you either, Pippin. Not another primrose! Guards, arrest this idiot and get these beasts out of my courtroom! I will have order! At that moment, I realized that chaos could be to our benefit. I started squabbling with Pippin so loudly that even the judge could not get a word in edgewise. The excited Ping seemed to follow and took the opportunity to tickle Percy's nose and send him into a violent sneezing fit while my cousin and I started shoving each other while Dr. Mercurio started lecturing the judge about a case involving the rights of trout and as fate is a funny thing, Mayor Squigglebottom's charming wife walked in holding a brand new dog. With an angry look in her eyes, Precious barreled through the crowd to chase the mayor's wife and the little dog around the room. The trial's various participants were running and screaming and ducking under benches to hide. It was at that moment when Dr. Mercurio gathered us together, put his arms around our shoulders, called Precious over to the lot of us. 
by the way, it's a pleasure to finally meet you, Miss Pippa. Your cousin has said many wonderful things about you. I trust you have already seen this to be a well-orchestrated escape plan. With that said, I will require you to grab hold when our ride gets here and not let go for any reason. So, as you can clearly see, there are still a good many things to consider about this case. However, I'm afraid we will be needing to take a quick recess while Mrs. Snottyburger cleans the dragon spit off her canine. So, as Judge Judith seems to be quite beside herself at the moment, I will, as a member of Middle of Founding Families, declare this call is now adjourned. Before the judge could call for us all to be clapped in irons, Mercurio placed a tiny flute to his lips and blew a short series of notes. The smell of ozone was immediately present, as with a large crackle pop, phased right in front of our little puddle with a deafening roar. I grabbed onto a tuft of her fur in one hand and my surprised cousin with the other, and quicker than you could say, snap, crack, pop, we disappeared, leaving chaos and confusion in our wake. Which, for those of you who have been privy to our previous adventures, is how we do it. Dr. Mercurio's mythical marvels and traveling menagerie is a production of GeppettoDreams.art in association with the Puppetry Institute. Everything's Apartment is written by Ricky Vincent and Michelle Avner. The show stars the voice talents of, in order of our parents, wait for it, Hannah Maria McLeod as Penelope, Ricky Vincent as Dr. Mercurio, the god which is a particular good favorite of mine, and Mayor Squigglebottom. Ray Esquire as Percy, Star Hagen Esquire as Sadie, Colette Harrison as Pippin, and Michelle Sharkle Dog Avner as Judge Judith. Dr. McCure's mythical models and traveling menagerie is protected under a Creative Commons license, which means don't change it, don't sell it, don't steal it, but by all means, share it with everyone you know. 